Welcome everyone, I'm Norman Walberger. We're here at the University of New South Wales and we're continuing on discussing homology. We want to do some more computations with homologies, but we're going to sort of work in this slightly more flexible situation of called delta complexes, where we think of these simplicial complexes as being a little bit more flexible than before. And we'll also talk, introduce uh, these important numbers called Betty numbers and talk a little bit about torsion in the uh, context of the projective plane. So we are, we're computing homology, and I want to talk now about uh, the torus. And let's try to compute its homology. Now, to, to make an honest, simplicial complex out of this means having to uh, subdivide its surface into lots of triangles. And a fair number of triangles is needed, especially if you can do it geometrically honest and actually get a, a torus in three-dimensional space. But what we would like to do, rather, is think more combinatorially in terms of this diagram that's very familiar with us, representing the torus in a planar way with a square with edges suitably identified. So we have uh, two edges uh, identified here. Let's call them A and A, and uh, two edges B and B. Okay, when we make this identification, I remind you that the corners are all actually the same point. So if we uh, call that x, well, that's also x, and that's also x, and that's also x. Well, the four corners of the square are coming together at this point x. So to make a triangular subdivision of this, we're going to do the simplest possible thing. We're going to just introduce a diagonal. And let's give that diagonal an arbitrary orientation, and let's call it C. So now we have two triangular simplices, but they're of a kind of a special kind. So if you just look at this top one here, let's uh, give it a name, let's call it capital A, and let's give it an orientation like this. And uh, let's uh, say here's B, and let's give it uh, also, uh, let's give it that orientation. So if you just look at A by itself for a second, if you think of uh, having a handkerchief, which is a triangular handkerchief, and what we're doing here is we're taking the three corners of this handkerchief and folding them together to a point because the three corners are identified to the point X. All right, so you can imagine, kind of imagine a triangular handkerchief, three things. So you're getting this sort of shape that has these three holes at this common point X at the bottom. In fact, we have two such shapes, one for A and one for B, and it's kind of interesting to think how these two shapes actually fit together along these common holes that they have to create the torus. All right, nevertheless, we're just going to work algebraically with this setup, so let's set up the chain complexes. So we have C0, C1, C2, and C3, well there are no uh, three-dimensional uh, chains floating around. So here are our chains, and what are these uh, built up from? C0 uh, is talking about the, the vertices. Well, there's only one vertex, actually, in this story. There's only one vertex, and that's called X. So this is just a simple group generated by an element X. And the, the one chains, well, there are really three edges, A, B, and C. So that's generated by A, B, and C. And the two chains are the faces A, capital A, and capital B. And there's our del 0, our del 1, our del 2, our del 3. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at uh, H0 like we usually do. Okay, H0 is going to be zero cycles over zero boundaries. And what's that going to be? Well, the cycles, the zero cycles, are all the things that are sent to zero. Well, that's everything. So that's just the group generated by X. And what are the boundaries? If we take the boundary of one of these edges, what do we get? 
Well, the boundary of A is initial minus final. That's X minus X. As a formal combination, that's zero. So the boundary of each one of these edges, because the edges actually are actually looping around to start and end at the same place, they're all zero. So all of the boundaries of the three edges are zero. So we're just talking about x mod zero, which is uh, just the group generated by x, which is z. Which corresponds to the fact that this is a connected uh, object, so its zeroth homology ought to be z. Okay, how about H1? H1 is one cycles over one boundaries. So let's have a look at the one cycles, the kernel of del 1. Well, we just said that the boundary of every one of these edges was zero. Every edge has boundary zero, so the kernel of del 1 is all of C1. It's the space spanned by A, B, and C. Since the boundary of A equals the boundary of B equals the boundary of C equals zero. What about the boundaries? The cycles that are coming from the two-dimensional cells. So B1 is the image of del 2. So that these two two-dimensional cells, A, capital A, and capital B, what are their boundaries? Well, the boundary of capital A is, the way I've got it oriented, it's going to be edge little a plus little b plus little c. And B, well, the way I've got it oriented, its boundary is also A plus C plus B. That's the same as the boundary of B. So th that means uh, that the, the image is just this group generated by the single element A plus B plus C. So the homology, the first homology, is the group generated by A, B, C mod the subgroup generated by the single element A plus B plus C. Okay, so how should we think about this, this quotient? This quotient is isomorphic to uh, z plus z, in other words, z squared. And maybe I'll say, say a little bit about, uh, about the geometry of these quotients here, which might be uh, helpful here. In fact, I'll do it. Let's talk a little bit about uh, subgroups of uh, z plus z for a moment. So here is z plus z. There's the usual integral lattice inside the plane. So z plus z, we're thinking of it as all these integer points in the plane. And this is a group under addition, and the addition is basically vector addition. Okay, what kind of subgroups does this thing have? Well, if we just look at this a simpler one-dimensional case, the, sub, the group Z, we know what its subgroups are. The subgroups of Z are all of the form N times Z for some N. So subgroups of Z are always of the form NZ for some uh, N in, in Z. For example, uh, 3Z or, or 5Z, etc. What about subgroups of this two-dimensional abelian group, uh, this rank 2 group Z plus Z? 
Well, there are different kinds. There are also one-dimensional subgroups like this. So this thing has one-dimensional subgroups. Obtained how? By just choosing a vector. You just choose a vector, your favorite vector, integral vector, let's call it v. And you choose all multiples of v. So this is just multiples of v, n times v, where n is in z. So we're looking at a line through the origin, and it's got these regularly spaced points on it. That's an example of a one-dimensional subgroup. That's a subgroup that's isomorphic to z. What about two-dimensional subgroups? Well, it also has two-dimensional subgroups, of course. And they are formed by taking pairs of vectors and looking at all combinations of pairs of vectors. So a two-dimensional subgroup is obtained by taking a vector v and another vector, say, u, and looking at all multiples of u and v. So these are the form u generated by u and v, where u and r, v are arbitrary vectors. So these are things of the form n u plus m v, where n and m are z in z. What that looks like is, it's usually called a lattice. A lattice generated by these two vectors. So we have a situation where we have these regularly spaced grid of points. Okay. Looking something like this. Okay. It's like another copy of Z plus Z, but it's a little bit sort of bigger or more spread out, and it's sort of at an angle, depending on the position of V and U. Now, what's important for such a subgroup is a fundamental domain in some sense. So if you take a, a parallelogram like this one, that's a fundamental domain for the, uh, the subgroup. And that means that Okay, if you translate by the, the elements of the subgroup, you can go from any point in the plane to a point inside or on the subgroup. Okay. So this is called say, a fundamental domain for such a subgroup. Let's call the subgroup uh, H fundamental domain for H. And the various cosets of H are indexed or labeled. So cosets of H in the big group G, which is uh, Z plus Z. The cosets of H and G correspond to points inside this uh, fundamental domain. Let's call it uh, del. Actually, it's not a triangle, so let's call it, let's, go, let's denote it by a parallelogram. In other words, the quotient of G mod H uh, looks like the points in, in the parallelogram with suitable identifications of opposite sides. All right, so there's something else I need to say here. So let, let me make the, the lattice a little bit smaller so we can see a little bit more detail. So suppose here is Z plus Z, there's the origin, there's X and Y. Suppose we have a subgroup generated by two vectors. Let's say uh, this one. And, and this one. Okay. 
So I can sort of visualize what this looks like. So it's going to consist of all these points here. an example of a subgroup generated by this particular vector v and that particular vector u. And you can kind of see that it has index 2. That is, it has exactly one coset. If I translate it by, say, 1 up, then I will get these blue points. Let me label them. The blue points like this. This is exactly a, a copy of the, the original subgroup in pink. And we can see that the two cosets fill everything out. So in this case, here we have a situation where the index of H in G is 2. OK, what, the importance of the 2 is that it comes about by uh, the area of this fundamental domain. This fundamental domain, what we're calling the thing, has area, which is basically a determinant. The determinant of, the, say, the vector, uh, this, this first vector is vector uh, 2, 0. The first vector is 1, 1. So that determinant uh, is 2. So you can see the size of a subgroup of z plus z by computing a determinant of the basis vectors. All right, so that's a quick introduction to subgroups of uh, z plus z, which is very relevant because most of our cycle groups and boundary groups, well, in fact, they're all always subgroups of our chain groups. So they're all looking like this. Of course, this is just when we have two copies of Z, but if you have three copies of Z, it's very much the same kind of story. It's not you know, substantially different. In that case, you have one-dimensional subgroups spanned by a single vector, two-dimensional subgroups spanned by two vectors, independent vectors, three-dimensional subgroups spanned by uh, three independent vectors. All right, so to go back to, uh, to our story here, we were looking at uh, the first homology, okay, and we decided that it's uh, generated, it's the group uh, generated by A, B, and C mod the subgroup generated by the element A plus B plus C. Okay. Now, one way of thinking about what that is, to sort of understand what is this quotient uh, doing, is to change basis. If we change basis, by not using A, B, and C, but by something, uh, something else, then the quotient can be a little bit easier to understand. Okay. And we can do that by noticing that the group generated by A, B, C is the same as the group generated by A plus B plus C, B, and C. A two-dimensional analog of that, to go back to what I was just talking about, would be this. If there's our z plus z with there the origin, if I change subgroup basis from, uh, if I change basis, let's say, from uh, a, b to, let's say, a and a plus b, well, this is a two-dimensional version. I want to convince you that the group generated by a, b is the same as the group generated by a plus b and b. Okay, so the group generated by A and B would be that entire uh, thing there. And where is A plus B? It is here. There's A plus B. And if I look at the subgroup generated by A plus B and say B, so by this vector and by this vector, well, then I'm going to get everything that I did that I had to begin with. I'm still going to get everything. Because A is a combination of these two. B is obviously in there, so everything in here is in there, and everything in here is in there. So these two groups are exactly the same. So 
if we perform that sort of change of basis to this situation here with this first homology and recognize that A, B, C, that group is the same as the group generated by A plus B plus C, then it becomes clear that when we take A, well, up here, then we, when we take this thing here, it's equal to the group generated by A plus B plus C, B, C, mod the group generated by A plus B plus C, now it's, it's kind of obvious that this is this isomorphic to the group just generated by B and C. In other words, it's Z2. Or it's Z plus Z. So that was a justification of why this first homology group is actually Z squared. And what about the second homology group? We've got C0. We've got the homology group of that, H0. We said that was Z. We've now computed H1 is equal to Z plus Z. What about H2? H2 is two cycles over two boundaries. So what are the two cycles? The two cycles are the kernel of del 2. So we're looking at combinations of alpha and beta that get sent to zero. So we're looking at things of the form alpha A plus beta B and asking, well, what does that go to under the boundary map? Well, that goes to, A goes to, the boundary of A is just A plus B plus C. And the boundary of B, well, it was also A plus B plus C. They were both uh, equal to that. So we're getting alpha minus beta, uh, A plus B plus C. And if we want that to be zero, it's going to work precisely when alpha equals beta. Telling us, therefore, that the kernel of delta 2 is the group generated by A plus B. That particular combination has boundary 0. And everything that has boundary 0 is a multiple of that. Well, what about the two-dimensional boundaries? We don't have any three cycles in this space. So the, the boundaries are just zero. So the image of del 3 is just zero. So our second homology is the group generated by A plus B divided by zero, which is isomorphic to Z. And so we can complete our, our story. So H2 is Z. So for the torus, we have H0 of the torus is Z. H1 of the torus was a Z plus Z. Representing sort of the two independent cycles that we're familiar with in the torus. And uh, H2 of T is Z representing the fact that there's a two-dimensional hole in the torus. The torus surrounds a two-dimensional hole. So it has two two-dimension two one-dimensional holes sort of corresponding to the two loops around it. One two-dimensional hole and its h0 is uh, is z and all the higher ones are zero. Go from alpha A plus B plus beta A plus B, then it's like alpha minus beta, like up there. From here? Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're investigating when this particular combination uh, gets sent to zero. Yeah. 
Okay, so we compute what this combination is, and there's the computation. And we ask, well, when can this be zero? It's got to be zero when this coefficient has is zero. Oh, I see. Oh, I, I see. There's an a plus b here. Oh, you're right. Okay, absolutely. Okay. So let, let me change that. Um, so when we when we did the arithmetic here, what we should have done is alpha plus beta times a plus b plus c, and so that occurs precisely when alpha equals minus beta. So the kernel is not a plus b, but rather a minus b. One minus the other, the way we've oriented it. And so the homology is a minus b over zero, which is z. Th thanks for picking that up. All right, so in our final example, we're going to look at the projective plane. Well, it's a little bit hard to draw. One way that we had of thinking about it was uh, a disk with the uh, edges uh, glued in a rather strange way. So that this edge was glued to that edge. And so opposite points. And another way of thinking about it is in terms of a square, a little bit more in keeping with uh, the Taurus and Klein bottle story, where we replace the single edge with two edges, say A and B. And then this one also with the same uh, thing, because it's got to be in the same direction, so A and B. And to triangulate it, to introduce this language of delta complexes, we'll just introduce a third edge there, called it C. Now what about the vertices? Well, if this is the vertex X, that's at the beginning of A, so this has to be X as well. But there's no need for this also to be X. This will be some, some typically uh, different point because it sort of corresponds to halfway along here. Let's call it Y. And then they, at the end of A, so that means this is Y as well. <clears throat> so our chain complex looks like this. We have C0 spanned by the vertices, which are just X and Y. We have the one chains spanned by the edges A, B, and C. The two cells, let's give them names, say capital A and capital B again, and let's uh, orient that one like this, and maybe uh, this one like that. So that's capital A and capital B are our two cells. And there's no three cells or anything higher. <clears throat> there's a zero boundary map, first boundary map, second boundary map, third boundary map. Okay, so the zeroth homology is Z0 over B0. That's going to be the group generated by X and Y because everything sent to zero by delta zero divided by the, the, uh, the image of these guys. Well, the boundary of A is Y minus X. The boundary of B is X minus Y. The boundary of C is X minus X, which is zero. So that's the subgroup generated by X minus Y because the boundary of A is Y minus X, the boundary of B is X minus Y, and the boundary of C is X minus X, which is zero. So again, we have the same kind of story. This is a, just a single copy of Z. Because we're identifying X and Y. How about H1? Okay, H1, we need to look at cycles mod boundaries. So let's look at them individually. So Z1, which is the kernel of del1. So what's that? 
So we're looking at which combinations of these things get sent to zero. Okay, so what kind of combination of these things gets sent to zero? Well, C all, always gets sent to zero. And for a combination of these two to get sent to zero, we need to take uh, A plus B. All right? So we can write down the generators are A plus B and C. Combination A plus B gets sent to zero, and C, of course, gets sent to zero, and any combination of A plus B and C gets sent to zero. What about the boundaries? So this is the image of delta two. Well, let's see what the boundary does on these two-dimensional sides. So the boundary of A is little a plus b plus c. And the boundary of capital B is, okay, we're going this way, so it's again A plus B, but now in the opposite direction of C, so it's A plus B minus C, minus C. So the image of the boundary, the, the image of the two cells under the boundary map is going to be just spanned by these things. So this is uh, spanned by A plus B plus C and A plus B minus C. Now, our homology group, H1, is then the quotient. So it's a quotient of A plus B C mod the group A plus B plus C comma A plus B minus C. We have to spend a little bit of time thinking, well, what, what is this? What is this thing? This is, this is a, a little bit of a new phenomena what's appearing here with the projective plane that we haven't seen in any of the previous examples and happening right here at this first homology. So to simplify uh, the algebra here, to simplify what's going on, we can think of A plus B as sort of being one element. Okay. So if we let uh, A plus B be, say, D for the sake of argument, we can write this as the the group generated by D and C, modded out by the group generated by D plus C and D minus C. And I can, uh, I'm going to write this as the group generated by D, C, mod the group generated by D plus C. I'm gonna, no, I'm going to do it in two stages, all at once. I'm going to rewrite the top group as the group generated by a D plus C and C. So do the opposite of what I did uh, in the previous example. Replace the group generated by D and C with the group generated by D plus C and C. That's the same because these two are linear combinations of these two, just as these two are linear combinations of these two. Integral linear combinations. And I'm going to replace the quotient group with D plus C, the group generated by D plus C, and the element 2C. So have a look at this. I claim that the group generated by D plus C and D minus C is the same as the group generated by D plus C and 2C. First of all, the 2C is just the difference between this one and this one. If I take this minus this, I get the 2C. So I can certainly get those ones as combinations of these ones. What about the other way around? Can I take combinations of these ones to get those ones? Yes, I can, because D plus C is the same as that D plus C. But the D minus C is this one minus this one. 
Again, with integral combinations. I'm not using any fractions. I'm not allowed to use any fractions. I have to do this arithmetic over the integers. But over the integers, these two groups are the same. And now it should be kind of clear what, what the quotient is. In the first generator, this and this agree. But in the second generator, I have a vector or an element mod twice that vector. So this is, uh, you, you can think of it as maybe z plus z mod z plus 2z. Okay, and we can think of that as the, the d plus c quotients don't matter. It's really the c mod 2c which makes the difference. So we're really getting z mod 2z. In other words, a group with just two elements, z2. This is the group with just two elements, 0 and 1, where arithmetic is uh, mod 2. It's the group that we get by looking at the integers. Mod the subgroup 2z. So the first homology group is not a vector space, really. It's just a, a finite group with two elements. And this sort of corresponds to the, this following geometric effect. That if you take this, this uh, path, or this loop, let's take, take this loop, okay? This is a loop in the space because it goes from this point to this point. But that loop is not uh, uh, homologous to zero. You can't contract it. But nevertheless, twice that loop, this is essentially twice that loop because this is, uh, well, this is A plus B, and this is also A plus B. If you take this plus this, twice that, you get something which is homologous to zero. You can then contract it to zero. So you have the situation where one path, one loop is, uh, is not zero, but twice that loop is zero. That's the geometrical explanation for this algebraic scenario. So H1, we've concluded H1 is therefore, uh, this is group Z2. What about H2, which is Z2 over B2? Well, so B2 is zero before, what's uh, Z2? What's the, uh, the boundary here? Yeah, so here's the, here's the boundary acting on A and B. Okay? So if I ask what combinations of these things get sent to zero, that's what we need to do when we compute uh, the Z2. So Z2 is the kernel of del 2. So we're looking at combinations alpha A plus beta B and asking when is that sent to zero. So that gets sent to A alpha times A plus B plus C a plus beta times a plus b minus c. And we're asking when is that zero? That'll be the condition for having a two-dimensional cycle. Well, that means that alpha plus beta times a plus b uh, plus alpha minus beta times c equals zero. We need both conditions that alpha plus beta equals zero and alpha minus beta equals zero. And that tells us that alpha and beta both have to be zero. In other words, the kernel, the cycles, are just zero. There are no non-trivial cycles. So Z2 is zero. And therefore, the second homology is 0 mod 0, which is 0. So in terms of homology, the projective plane does not have a two-dimensional hole. The sphere does, the closely related sphere, but the homology does not. 
So let's write the conclusions. So we found that H0 of the projective plane is Z because it's connected. H1 of P is just this finite group with two elements. And H2 of P is perhaps surprisingly zero. And all the other higher ones are obviously zero. So there's, uh, of course, a lot more to homology. This is just the very beginnings of the story. Uh, we haven't really laid out the theory very uh, explicitly or formally. Uh, there's a lot of uh, theoretical tools that help us actually calculate homology more efficiently than, than these te techniques, so for more complicated spaces. But I want to uh, just connect back to um, actually Poincaré's original point of view and connect the homology that we're, that we're getting here with the Euler characteristic that we talked about earlier. So Poincaré's original point of view, who, who Poincaré basically uh, introduced homology, was not at all in terms of groups. Okay? So Poincaré's original orientation, and this should be zero, Poincaré's original orientation was in terms of, of numbers. Okay? So and these things are now called Betty numbers. So Betty numbers. Uh, so Bn is the rank of Hn, okay. the Betty number of a space of a space x. I may remind you that if you have a an abelian group, okay, if a the group Hn can be written as Z plus Z plus Z, say uh, uh, B1 times then that B1 is called the rank. But a general group might also have some, some finite cyclic pieces like Z, uh, Zn1 and uh, Zn2 and maybe up to Znk. Okay. So these are the infinite cyclic components of this commutative group. These are the finite subgroups and Poincaré originally uh, thought in terms of numbers, in terms of these numbers here, counting how many Zs appear, and then obviously sort of some kind of analysis of what kind of numbers occur in the finite part. All right, so this is the, the sort of the Betty numbers part of the homology, and these finite pieces are usually called uh, sort of torsion, give torsion coefficients. I won't be too precise about that. Okay, but basically torsion refers to the finite, uh, finite part of the commutative group of the Hn. And this is a n, so this should be uh, the nth Betty number. So these Betty numbers are, are, are very pleasant. And a, a lovely fact is that if you compute the Euler characteristic of the space of X, that it's related to these Betty numbers by the formula B0 minus B1 plus B2 minus B3 and so on, well, up to until the sort of eventually the series stops. So I'll just write it like this. So for example, if we go back to our sphere, I hope you all remember that the Euler characteristic of the sphere is equal to two. And what are the homology gr groups? Well, H0 was equal to Z, H1 was equal to zero, had zero one-dimensional holes, and H2 was equal to Z itself. So B0 is equal to 1, B1 is equal to 0, B2 is equal to a 1, and all the other ones, all the higher ones, are 0.
So in this case, the, uh, this theorem amounts to the fact that the Euler characteristic of the sphere, which is two, is equal to the Betty number B0 minus B1 plus B2, which is one minus zero plus one. And for the torus, well, we know that the torus has Euler characteristic zero. We know that the homologies are H0 is Z, H1 is Z squared, and H2 was Z, and all the other ones were zero. And so the this theorem amounts to the Euler characteristic, which is zero, is B0 minus B1 plus B2 equals uh, one minus two plus one. And finally, for the projective plane, I hope you remember that the Euler characteristic of the projective plane is equal to one. We've just figured out that H0 of P is Z, H1 of P is the group Z2, H2 of P was zero, and all the higher ones are also zero. And so the Euler characteristic of the P, which is one, should be B0 minus B1 plus B2 minus B3 and so on. And how does that work? Well, the B0 is one. What is B1? It's the rank of this group. The group is not zero, but its rank is zero because it doesn't have any infinite cyclic components. So the B1 is zero. And the B2, uh, it's, that's also zero. All the rest are zeros. And we'll get one equals one which is probably a good place to stop. All right, so in my next lecture, which might be a, a while from now, I hope to uh, start talking about uh, three-dimensional manifolds and sort of topology in higher dimensional spaces. So I hope you'll join me for that. <laughs>